Hello, everyone. I see some of you have already started um, filtering in. I see some familiar faces and some new faces. So thank you, everybody, for joining. I'm hoping that the change in time will make it easier for more people to attend. Just some um, words about how this works. Um, as you uh, watch the presentation, you can ask questions in the Q&A box. You'll see there's a Q&A box. There's also a chat window that you can use. Um, I try to monitor all of those things. Um, it can be difficult. If you see something pop up and I miss it, please don't hesitate to remind me. If you're watching live on Facebook, that's fine. Um, I do check there for questions occasionally, but not as often as I do um, the actual webinar screen. So if you're watching live on Facebook, which I see a couple of you are, um, um, so I see a couple of you on Facebook Live. So just know I'm managing a couple of different screens and try to be patient with that and me um, getting your questions answered. So we'll go ahead and get started. I'm curious of those of you that are here, how many of you are familiar, and I'll go ahead and do a poll here, um, how many of you are familiar with, uh, with parentification? If you are, um, go ahead and type a yes into the Q&A box. How many of you have heard that term before? Um, how many of you maybe feel like you've struggled with it? I'm curious if it's a new thing or if you've heard of it before. Um, I see Catherine says she has, which is great. Um, it's a fairly not often used term. <laughs> so we don't, you don't hear it used a lot. In fact, if you try to type it into any word processing program, you'll probably get a, um, a spelling error message. Um, so it's not a super common term that you hear tossed around, but it is a common thing that happens, especially for children who are in homes where abuse takes place. Um, and so let's just go ahead and dive in here. Normally in our webinars, I like to share a story um, and I, I will do that. I'm going to share a couple of different stories. Um, but I don't have someone here to share their specific story today. Um, and I apologize, my PowerPoint is not responding to touch. Okay, there we go. So the first thing I have here are some um, quotes for you. Children are the most valuable natural resources. This was Herbert Hoover. Um, Celesta included this in the Caring for the Vulnerable Child book. And you're always a kid around your parents unless they're acting like children and then you don't get a chance, which I thought was kind of ironically funny. I think there's a couple things we need to address before we jump into the actual, like, what is it? What do we do about it conversation? And that's some ideas we have about parents. Um, I have some quotes here. I just went on the internet and tried to find some quotes that might conjure some emotion for some of you. Um, never complain about what your parents couldn't give you. It was probably all they had. So we hear this a lot. Um, you might hear something like, uh, but she's your mother. <laughs> you can't talk badly about her because she's your mother and she did her very best, right? Um, the truth is, is that sometimes all, you, all a parent had isn't enough and it's highly damaging and, and it's simply not okay to hurt a child. Even Jesus says that. Um, my identity rests solely and firmly on this. I am my mother's daughter. Um, what I hear when I hear this is the lack of, of, of self, of taking on so much of mom that you don't have yourself and your own identity, which is kind of one of the things that can really be damaging for a parentified child or the child of a narcissist. And sometimes those lines are really blurred. A father's goodness is higher than the mountain. A mother's goodness is deeper than the sea. I wish that was true all of the time for all of us, right? Um, parental love is the only love that is truly selfless, unconditional, and forgiving. I think most of us at Mending the Soul would agree that the only love that is selfless, unconditional, and forgiving is, is God's love. Um, a parent's love is made of deep devotion, sacrifice, and pain. It is endless, unselfish, and enduring, come what may. So what I want to say to anybody that's watching or 
you know, for your participants that may struggle with this is it is tremendously difficult in our culture to find fault with parents. And this is oftentimes the difficulty in, in calling stuff from our family of origin abuse. To use the word abuse seems wrong because it's our parents. And on one hand, we know they really loved us. And then on the other hand, we know they really hurt us. And so how do we hold those two things at the same time? We also know we really love them and we may now have a functioning relationship with them. And so what happens if we start to be honest about our experiences as children? Um, and I just want to encourage everybody that the, being honest doesn't mean that we have to villainize or demonize our parents, but it does allow us to heal some of those places that are still really hurting. So some of this stuff may be really close for you and that's okay. And it doesn't mean your parent is a horrible person. It means that they didn't do um, the best by you. They might've done their best, but they didn't do the very best for you. So in terms of our relationship with God, what does it mean to honor our parents? Um, in Exodus, it's one of the 10 commandments. If you went to Catholic school, I went to Catholic school and grew up Lutheran. So we memorize these things in church, honor thy father and thy mother. So honor is an interesting word. We don't talk about what that means. I think typically it's taught obey, right? I know that my, my husband who grew up Baptist had to memorize this children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. And I remember when we had kids, some of the older people he grew up with told me, you need to teach your kids that verse. I'm like, we'll also teach them the second part. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So yes, God wants us to obey our parents. Yes, he wants us to honor them with obedience and love and respect. However, Paul is really clear here in Ephesians that it is possible for a father or a mother to provoke their child to anger. Um, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about how that might happen today. Um, one of the ways we know that might happen is through abuse for sure. Um, and parentification, I think, is one of those insidious things that oftentimes doesn't look like abuse, um, but the damages are really far reaching, the consequences, um, and the symptoms are oftentimes mis, uh, misread for being other things. So um, an academic definition is that Parentification is anything involving the unilateral and self-serving use of children by parental figures to satisfy possessive, dependent, aggressive, and sexual needs by the parents. Um, try not to be focused on this sexual needs thing. That can happen a lot of times um, in single parent or even like really abusive um, with abusive fathers where incest takes place. Oftentimes parentification is this underlying thing behind the parentification, behind the incest. But really what happens here is that the child becomes the mate, the adult, the caretaker in the relationship. Um, and we'll look at this a little later, um, but it's, it has to do with the unmet needs of the parent from their childhood. Um, so the child becomes this loyal object, not their own person that needs loyalty, but the thing that gives the parent loyalty, that gives the parent nurturance, that gives them the recognition and the support that they lacked as children. So causation, um, what causes this? What kinds of people become parents who parentify or adultify their children? Um, it has a lot to do with the parent's family of origin, the quality of their parent-child relationship. Um, if, they were, if there was a lack of boundary, like in terms of sex abuse in their childhood, um, neglect, if they were parentified, maybe they were overprotected, they didn't get their needs met in terms of building their own sense of self, their own individuation, their own um, ego strength in terms of their relationship with their parents. Um, their attachment with their caregivers was probably off. So there was a role reversal that occurred um, <clears throat> and their attachment figure was unavailable. So attachment figure would be mom, dad, and the primary caregiver. Um, so their emotional needs were just not met. Oftentimes they might describe their childhoods as being vacant or that they felt like they were a ghost or invisible in their homes. Um, Self-differentiation, early emotional impoverishment, the primary narcissistic needs of many parentifying parents for recognition and empathy were frustrated. So if you've had children, you know that they are the most narcissistic beings on the planet. Everything is about them and it's supposed to be that way. Um, they see the world through very... Um, individual eyes. They don't see the world about everything else. So you might have noticed this, that if parents are fighting, even if kids can hear what the words are, they're going to automatically think it's about them. 
Um, that's how kids view the world. So these parents that end up parentifying their, their children didn't get those needs of recognition and empathy met when they were young. Generational dynamics, oftentimes you see this happen generation after generation after generation, and it can go one of two ways. A parentified parent could end up infantilized, infant, 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 making their children like infants, <laughs> can't say that word, um, making their children like infants, or parentifying their children because they didn't get their needs met. So it can go one of two ways. And that's of course, if there's no healing that takes place. I just wanna do a check-in, any questions so far, feel free to use that Q&A box. Um, if you're watching on Facebook, um, feel free to type a question in there as well and I will try to get to it um, during our time together. I'm gonna to pull that up on my phone so that I can be aware of it. Um, okay. So there's two different types of parentification that you'll see. Um, Excessive caretaking, and this is another definition, um, excessive caretaking that extends beyond situational adaptation to become a chronic process depletes children both emotionally and physically. So let's just say that mom's in a car accident and dad works. And so for a period of 10 months, the kids take on more adult responsibility in the house. And so they're cooking, they're cleaning, they're maybe helping mom get to the toilet, they're getting the younger siblings off to school, all the things that mom would normally do that she can't do. So that shortened period of time is not this chronic, long-term just way of life. Um, it's disruptive in the development of the children, but it's not permanent and typically isn't going to become a part of their identity. Um, it's not gonna be as damaging. So that's not the kind of thing we're looking at. That teaches children to be a part of a family. That teaches children to care uh, together with family because typically mom is still going to be meeting their emotional needs. Okay, so generational dy dynamics, this is a question. Um, generational dynamics basically means that um, what has happened for the parent in their um, family of origin. So a parentified child will grow up and without any help will typically either parentify their own children meaning that my needs were never met and now it's your job to meet my needs. Or they will um, turn their child into infants who are un incapable of taking on responsibility and being responsible for themselves. Um, infant, infant, why? I can see it in my head, I can't say it. Infantilizing, I can't say it. Um, but so those are the two things that can happen for somebody that, is, that does not heal these wounds and learn to do differently. So typically it ends up happening generation after generation. If you ever do like a genogram, which you might have done like a family tree where you mark the relationships between people, um, you'll see that this happens generation after generation. Okay. So the opposite of parentifying is an ethical family relationship in which parents are sensitive to the asymmetry, asymmetry asymmetries vis-a-vis -vis their children. Although they enjoy their children's loyalty, concern, and growth, and increasingly alternate subject and object roles with them in developmentally appropriate ways, they accept the fact that their contributions outweigh those of their offspring. They do not expect equal reciprocity in their relationships with their children as they do in their spousal relationships. So oftentimes when I'm talking to people about this, I'll get, but kids should help and kids should caretake. And shouldn't I be able to talk to my kids about family problems? The difference here is, is that in a parent-child relationship, the parent is always the primary caretaker. The parent is always primarily concerned with the child, not with self. You can be concerned with self with your spouse and with your friends, but in a parent-child situation, an ethical parent-child relationship, the parent is always going to be primary caretaker. The child should not be the primary caretaker. So the two kinds of parentification that we see are functional parentification and emotional or expressive parentification. Functional parentification is exactly what it sounds like. These kids are the ones doing the dishes, they're cooking the meals, they're grocery shopping, they're, um, they're providing 
uh, financial support to the family. They're taking care of their younger siblings. And I'm not talking like one time I needed to go grocery shopping, but all of that is on my shoulders as the child. Um, they're cooking the meals, they're nursing an ill or disabled parent. So um, consider someone who maybe is a single parent that has a debilitating disease or illness that requires round the clock care. For a child to be put in that position is really detrimental to the child's health. Um, if the child is responsible for earning an income. Emotional or expressive parentification, we see this a lot in abusive or narcissistic families. So this is um, a child protecting a parent. So consider a domestic violence situation where the oldest child is always trying to defend mom um, or they're defending their other system, sisters and brothers, or they're putting themselves in the middle of the abuse so that they're the only ones that are hurt. Um, I've heard of incest cases where the oldest sister will allow or submit to the abuse to protect other siblings. Um, where the child is serving as the confident, confidant or proxy spouse, companion or mate-like figure. Um, in some cases, this can even move into incest where there's sexual relationship between the parent and the child. In most cases, it looks like, uh, can you sleep with me tonight? I'm really lonely now that daddy's gone or I don't like to be alone in my bed and I don't want you to be alone either, so you can sleep with me, or mommy's really sad, here's all the details of my divorce. Um, those are things that kids are not equipped to be able to handle. It's too much for their cognitive abilities. Um, mediating conflicts between parents or between parent and other sibling, siblings, providing emotional support, nurturance and comfort. If the child is always comforting a depressed, or an anxious parent, if the child is always nurturing the parent or helping the parent cope, that's very damaging and puts the child in the primary caretaker mode. So that was a lot of information and I'm gonna go ahead and ask you if you have any questions about any of that stuff. If anything's, you know, if you're feeling uncomfortable with any of it, please ask. Okay, so some of the effects that we'll see. I want to be really careful with this because I know a lot of you are facilitators of our groups. Um, when you see someone in your group that tends to be a helper and a rescuer, chances are that they helped and rescued people in their family of origin, that their role in their family was to help and, and protect and help and rescue and help and nurture. And so this need to jump in and save the day really is a part of their identity. So one of our rules in our groups is that we don't allow that, that that is that we focus on our own healing. This can be almost impossible for someone who has not recognized that they were parentified and what that was and why it was wrong. Um, so this can be really helpful to you to give new language to some of the things that they might be experiencing. So age appropriateness, the earlier and the more age inappropriate the caretaking charge, the more destructive the consequence of the child. So I'll just tell you a little bit of my story, which I shared a little bit last semester for, in one of our webinars. My mom is mentally ill, um, clinically depressed, had had a nervous breakdown and was in the hospital. And so at about three or four, um, she was agoraphobic. She wouldn't go outside. She was in and out of the hospital. She took tons and tons of medicine to be able to function or not function. Most of the time she just slept. So my job was to make sure we made it where we needed to go to wake her up. I had to feed myself. Sometimes I had to feed her. Um, I dressed myself. I got myself ready for school. All of those things at a very young age. So my mom will recount that in preschool at three years old, they moved me up with, with the five-year-olds because I was parenting the little girls and boys in the three-year-old classroom. Surprise, surprise, that didn't stop just because I was with five-year-olds, right? I continued to parent and caretake the five-year-olds because at home I was caretaking a 30-year-old. So the thing is here, if you see this in a child where they are not able to connect with a peer and engage in play, chances are that's because they're not learning that at home. At home, they're learning how to be an adult. And the earlier that happens, the more it becomes a permanent part of their identity. And that's the second one, internalization. So has the parentified caretaker role become a part of his or her identity? Do you see this coming out in every relationship? Are they even able to have peer-to-peer -peer relationships? Or are they always the rescuer, the therapist, 
this is the teenage girl that's the mother hen and doesn't participate in any teenage activities because she's too busy telling her friends all of the dangers that await them. It's the teenager who has all the friends come to her for help, but when she needs a friend, no one's there. Um, things like that. It's the woman who has trouble finding female relationships because nobody can meet her needs. She's too busy meeting everybody else's needs. Um, some of the other effects, family boundaries are impacted. The family dynamics with other siblings and parents will have an, will have an impact on the scope and severity of the impact of, on the child. So if the parentified child is responsible for other siblings, um, that will have an increase in the severity of the impact because they're again not interacting with peers in their home appropriately. Um, if the parent, depending on how it, if the parents are both are still married and the parentified child is between them, that triangulation can create some other issues for the parentified child. So there's a lot of dynamic situations that will change the effects of parentification, but really the primary things um, are what we're gonna talk about here in symptomology. So um, Jerkovic is probably the primary um, expert has one of the best studies that I've read on parentification. And he says, regardless of sex or age, pathologically parentified children are at risk of experiencing a variety of cognitive, emotional, and socio-familial difficulties. So I talked a little bit about this loss of childhood. These are people that can't play, they can't imagine, um, they can't relax. Interestingly enough, some of the studies that have been conducted show that infants by the age of 12 months have already learned the ability to tell when one of their parents is, is not okay emotionally and will respond to that. And by two years old, if you take a group of children who have been raised by depressed mothers and a group of children who have been raised by healthy mothers, the children raised by depressed mothers are more easily agitated by mood change than those raised by healthy mothers. What does that tell us? That tells us that very early on, this caretaking mechanism in children kicks in and they learn how to help parents improve their mood. So if I am happy, if I don't ever complain, if I never say no, mom is happier and then the house is happier. Um, typically children who are parentified very young are not your typical toddler. They don't throw temper tantrums, they don't say no, they're extremely compliant and obedient. So that developmental stage where they learn their own will, where they learn to test boundaries, doesn't happen. Um, and that is a key component to becoming a self and developing your own will and developing your own identity is learning when to say no, when no is appropriate, learning that you actually have permission to say no sometimes. So those are key things. You'll see that these children have a preoccupation with caretaking. Later in life, once they have differentiated from their parents, you'll see bitterness, depression, disappointment, a feeling of being dead or numb. A large majority of these people have dreams of being dead, um, of being at their own funerals, of feeling completely numb inside. Um, pervasive mistrust, and this, this includes a mistrust in self. So the capacity is fostered by caretakers who accept appropriately, who accept and respond appropriately to their offspring's spontaneous thoughts, emotions, and needs. So as parents, we're the attachment figure. When our kids have an emotion or a thought or a need and it comes out of nowhere, we respond and we accept that and we love them and we help them deal with that. For a parentified child, that doesn't happen. There is this element of focus back on the parent. Um, there is not space for the child to express any kind of emotion or feeling or need. And so the child grows up to believe that that stuff going on on the inside isn't valid and they have trouble expressing it. So this is the wife who never asks for help. This is the wife who has trouble accepting help from others who feels like she needs to do it all on her own. This is the man who can't take any assistance from anybody ever. Um, you can imagine that these pe people become very burdened and, um, and depressed and oftentimes even suicidal. Some other symptoms, and I'm gonna talk about this picture in a minute. Um, anger and resentment, these would not be expressed at home. Um, if you think about these kids being in your classroom, if you're a vulnerable child um, facilitator, if you've taken that curriculum and you're a teacher or a foster parent, 
that anger is not going to be expressed towards the parents because my job is to protect my parent. My job is to make sure they're happy. My job is to make sure they're okay. So that anger is going to come out other places. Um, stress, and this is from Jerkovic study, in many cases, parentified children meet the diagnostic criteria for generalized anxiety disorder or adult-oriented worry. Guilt and shame, they, are, they have this inner disappointment that their parents are not what they should be, but they can't express that and don't have space for it. And so oftentimes that shows up as toxic shame. Peer problems, I talked about this a little bit, that they are the, the therapist, the mother hen, they might be a loner. Um, in some cases, they might show rebellious behaviors in their adolescent years. Um, that's a little more rare. You might see that in their late adolescent years, they kind of just give up and become very lazy and their academics suffer. And oftentimes that's due to the exhaustion. They simply aren't built to carry these adult problems. And so by the time they're 16, 17, 18, they're done. Like they can't do it anymore. And so they just give up um, and they feel that they've earned a rest. Disruption and identity development, underdeveloped sense of self um, and identity, their entire mechanisms are other fo others focused. So they can't tend to their own emotions. They can't acknowledge their own emotions or needs or desires. Um, occupational issues, they might find themselves highly dissatisfied in careers. Typically these people end up as therapists <laughs> or in the helping professions. So, um, it's, if, if these people get help, if we heal those wounds, we can be really helpful to other people. But this rescuer mentality, this helper mentality, this caretaker mentality does become a part of the identity and, and they are typically drawn towards helping professions. And then personality dysfunction is kind of the extreme. Without help and treatment, you can end up with a narcissistic personality disorder or other personality disorders, um, clinical depression, et cetera. I think we've all seen some form of this woman. She's, this, this is part of a series of photographs that was taken during the Great Depression. And it struck me because um, some of us are old enough to have had grandparents who lived through the Great Depression. I am, I know some of you are. Um, and we know how bad it was. This particular woman we know was suffering greatly. Um, but I, what I like about her is that she's not smiling and happy pretending that it's not hard, but her children are leaning on her. She's still holding her baby. She's still comforting her child. She's not pushing him away. <laughs> She's not allowing the child to comfort her. She's still there. And to me, this is the picture of, of a, a mom who maybe is struggling, but is still being the mom. And that really is the key here. It's okay to struggle. It's okay to need help. Your children cannot be the ones helping you. So what's the opposite? Well, you're, most of you are going to be familiar with Mending the Soul. Steve and Celeste have all, also written this book called Care, Take, Caring for the Vulnerable Child. Um, and this was rooted in um, helping families who are fostering or fostering to adopt or teachers who are working with any student really, um, helping them learn to care for children that are vulnerable. Um, and so I took some things out of that to help us know how to, what to do, because if we are wounded parents, if we come from a trauma background, chances are we might ride the fence of parentifying our children if we're not careful. So here's how to be a grace-filled parent, and this is from Celesta in the Caring for the Vulnerable Child book. Um, affirm out loud. So make sure that you say to your children affirming statements about their emotions and their experiences. Focus on people, not performance. I would say focus on relationship, not performance. The child is important, not necessarily that they meet all of the performance standards. Communicate your rules and expectations clearly with your voice. So if you come from an abusive home, you know that oftentimes there are a lot of unspoken rules that the children don't know. And then suddenly they've broken an unspoken rule and they're in trouble. Um, communicate directly versus encode. This is kind of the same thing. Make sure you're really clear. Um, I have a friend whose parents used to leave notes for her instead of actually talking to her. Um, that's really damaging. Your kids need to see your face. They need to hear your words. You need to be able to communicate with them. See God as your source of value rather than your children. So remember that quote I shared at the beginning that um, if I'm anything, I am my mother's daughter. Your value is not in your relationship with your parents. Your value is in your relationship with God. And your value is not in your relationship with your children. If you're relying on your children to tell you how wonderful you are, you're going to be greatly disappointed 
because it is unhealthy for them to think that you're perfect when they are differentiating and individuating and becoming their own people. Um, eventually, hopefully they will think that. Parentified children usually do not make very good adult children. <laughs> They typically do not want to be close to their parents. So it's really important that when they're young, they be your focus and not your own feelings that you're getting from them. Enjoy them. Play with them. If you were parentified um, or have a lot of trauma that was when you were young, chances are it's difficult for you to play. However, play and imagination are where a lot of healing happens. So if you can kind of find something, whether it's coloring, finger painting, Play-Doh, Legos, that you can make fun, do that. Enjoy your children. Make children responsible and accounting, accountable for their own choices. So remember we talked about um, that parentified parents can make their children more like infants and less responsible than they should be, or they can repeat the, the, the parentification that occurred to them. This is, this is how we protect against them. Children should be responsible for their own choices. If they disobey, there should be discipline. If they um, make a choice that's not wise, there should be consequences. Um, but they're not responsible for your choices. Um, if you don't pay the light bill, it's not their job to pay it. If you don't go grocery shopping, they shouldn't be the ones to pay for that. Teach head skills for the purpose of learning. This is kind of the same thing. If you are a parent and you're familiar with Love and Logic Parenting or Dan Siegel, um, incorporating the cognitive processing when you're teaching kids about decision making and about their emotions and how to self-regulate is really important. If you have questions about that, I'm happy to address that at the end. Um, just checking Facebook for questions. Um, emphasize heart skills as valid and useful. Our feelings are really important. They do inform us about what's happening in our relationships and in our world. Um, expect the outside to match the inside. For many of us, it does not. <laughs> for many of us, that can be a chore to heal enough that the outside does match the inside. But for our kids, we really want them to feel safe and comfortable showing their insides on the outside. Behavior is behavior rather than behavior is identity. So we are not the sum total of our choices. We have identity outside of our mistakes. Um, so this is from Ephesians, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So I wanted to take a minute to talk about what happens if you're the parent of an adult child and you've listened to this and suddenly you're thinking, oh my goodness, I messed up. Um, Someone once said to me that the most powerful thing that a parent can do in the life of a child is apologize. And so I included this also taken from Celeste's Caring for the Vulnerable Child, um, the characteristics of a meaningful apology. If you have small children at home, you should be apologizing when you make mistakes. It teaches them to apologize. It teaches them empathy and it shows them that you are capable of seeing their feelings and tending to them and it teaches them how to tend to their feelings. So the first thing is to take full responsibility, sound like you mean it, commit to not repeat the behavior, listen to how the person feels about your behavior, respect the right of the wronged person to be hurt for a while. So just because you said you're sorry doesn't mean that they have to stop hurting. That's hard sometimes because we want our apology to just make it all go away. Um, you'll hear this when you're fighting. But I said I'm sorry. I heard you, but it still hurts, right? Um, make restitution that's both sacrificial and painful. So in the event that there needs to be restitution, um, it, it, should, it should cost something of us. It should cost us at the very minimum our time and our heart um, and our emotions. And these are the top 10 needs a child has for intimacy. So a child needs to be believed in, they need to be cared about, they need to be enjoyed. They really need to feel like they are de the delight of your life. They need to be forgiven often. They need to be loved deeply. They need to be kept safe, supported, trusted, understood, and valued. And that is all I have on our slides today. But I really do want to answer questions because I have a feeling that this comes up a lot in group for you guys. And so I'm going to go ahead and open the window for um, questions. 
and go ahead and type in any questions that you have about it, about how to address it in group. It's not discussed in detail in the Mending the Soul curriculum. Um, so it might, it might be helpful for you to get your arms around it here. And if you need any advice, have you ever experienced somebody now that we've gone over it? What are some thoughts you have? Did any of it feel uncomfortable for you? Um, what do you think? I'm looking at Facebook. No questions. I'm shocked you guys don't have more questions. Facebook, any questions? Okay. Tammy, yeah, I now realize this is a generational thing, yeah. And Tammy, you have Southern roots. So for you, this just means we're taking care of each other. We're just loving each other real well, right? This doesn't mean that there's something wrong. Are you able to see some of the damage that it does in terms of self-development? And then from an anonymous person, can more than one child in the family have this issue? Yes. So if there are multiple uh, siblings, sometimes one sibling will be the one that mom goes to to cuddle and love on. And then the oldest sibling might be responsible for all of the functional stuff in the family. Um, typically there are, there are different roles when there's more than one sibling, but you know what? Abusive families are just like any other families and there can be a myriad of different dynamics. Um, I think that a lot of different, um, a lot of different things can take place. And I have a comment on Facebook from Kathy that says, I think the best way to honor a person, a person can honor their parent is to get healthy as an adult. I absolutely agree. Tammy, that's hard. That's really hard. Thank you for sharing that though. Anybody else have any questions? If you have anybody in your group that's dealing with this and you have questions about how to how to address it, um, uh, please come into the Facebook facilitator page and ask us there and we'd be more than happy to help you with that. Um, as with anything, we don't want to jump into someone's life and say, that's abusive. This is what's wrong with your parents. We want to kind of guide someone through like, well, what do you think is healthy parenting? What is ethical parenting? What does that look like? Like, what should you reasonably expect from a five, six, seven-year-old? What should you reasonably expect um, from um, a 10, 15-year-old? Yes, this is the book that I quoted most of the research from. It is highly academic. It's actually a doctoral dissertation. Uh, it's by Gregor Jerkovic. It's called Lost Childhoods. There's another one that's called um, Burden Children that's also on parentification. If you're, this is, I should have added this a little bit early, earlier. Adult children of alcoholics deal with this big time. Um, if you look up adult children of alcoholics on the internet and look at the, it's called a laundry list of symptoms. Um, that's really helpful for adult children. And the thing about adult children of alcoholics is I think most of the laundry list applies to adult children of addicts and adult children of mentally ill parents. So a parent that struggled with any kind of mental illness from depression to, you know, personality disorders, bipolar and schizophrenia. So those things can also be really helpful resources. Um, and the other mending the soul curriculum is caring for the vulnerable child. Um, we have facilitator trainings on this and not as many groups. These are typically family oriented groups where the whole family goes through it together. But if you're a parent, it's got some pretty good stuff in it that will make you deal with your own stuff as you parent. And I don't know about you guys, but I find about 90% of the stuff that comes up for me as a mom is my stuff, not them. Anything else? Um, Jean says, it is something new to me, but I do see the patterns and also see where I might have done this to my children when my husband experienced depression. Yeah. I think most of us have experienced it on some level. And honestly, I think that um, if you have any kind of abuse in your home, chances are there was an element of this on some level. 
All right, guys, Tammy, if you want to um, hop onto Facebook after this, I would love to chat with you for a minute if you're interested. All right, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Please register for the future webinars at mendingthesoul.org forward slash webinars. Um, and we have some, they're all going to be formatted kind of like this. And then I'm going to do some spotlights with special guests this season. So they'll be a little bit different than they were over the summer. Um, but I love having you here and I'm hoping that these will be really helpful in um, helping you talk to people about trauma and what trauma is. So thanks everyone for coming and interacting and I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye.